Hello, everybody. How are we doing? Good. Just good? Great. 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 Okay. So before I begin, uh, I would like to uh, give an acknowledgement uh, that the land that we are currently on at the Exploratorium uh, actually is traditional land of the Ramaytush Ohlone people. Uh, in particular, the Yelamu tribe uh, was the steward of this particular land. Uh, so I think it's important to acknowledge history and the elders, both past and present, who took care of this land. Okay? Now, that's a small chunk of history, and now we're going to go back way further in history, and we're going to actually talk about gravitational waves. So thank you, Sam, for the lovely introduction. So we're gonna talk about catching gravity waves, right? It's pretty cool. I did have some surfers on here, but I thought it looked a little too cheesy, so I took them out, okay? There are some seats here if people wanna come in, okay? Um, now, in order to talk about catching gravity waves, first of all, we have to know how are we gonna catch them and what are they in the first place, right? So in order to think about what gravity waves are, first we're gonna talk about waves in general. Okay, just a quick refresher. So waves, we like to think of, why is this thing there? I don't know, it doesn't matter. Uh, waves, we like to think of as oscillations in space that carry information and or energy, okay? So water waves is a perfect example. Everybody's familiar with water waves, right? Okay, how do we make water waves? We move water, right? We just oscillate the water, so we cause some disturbance in the water, and then we have this ripple in the water that travels, right? Then we also have sound waves. Sound waves are a little bit different than water waves. This is a pressure wave. And so now I'm causing this disturbance in space in the molecules in front of my mouth, and then they're pushing on the molecules in front of them, which are pushing on the molecules in front of them, till they get to your ear, and they vibrate your ear bones, and then you can hear, right? And then, of course, there's light waves, which originate with electrons. And so now if I have an atom, I have an electron sitting in its happy little state there. And then if the electron moves, I'm oscillating the electron and causing a disturbance in the electromagnetic field, which gives me a light wave, right? So this is great. These are all very familiar light or very familiar waves that everybody knows about. But what about gravity waves, right? What is a gravity wave? First of all, what is gravity? Right? We have to actually understand what gravity is in order to fully get how we can measure a gravitational wave. So this lovely dude over here, Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, excuse me, when he was in his 20s, about 350 years ago, he said, hey, you know what? I know what gravity is. Gravity is this force that exists when you have an object that has a lot of mass, it pulls on everything else. So everything that has a mass pulls on every other thing. And that happens right away, okay? This is what he said, it's called action at a distance. So he said every mass that exists pulls on every other mass that exists right away, and space exists there, and it doesn't matter, right? Space doesn't really interact with us, it exists there, and we pull on each other. And the force that we feel depends on how much mass we have and how far away we are, right? And this is great, and it was widely accepted and still is taught in school today. Hopefully all of you guys know who Isaac Newton is. He's the dude with the apple. It didn't actually fall on his head, but it was part of his whole thing, right? So this was accepted for about 250 years, but there were some things wrong with it, like the planet Mercury, for instance. It orbits around our sun in a kind of funny way that Newton's laws didn't fully um, solve for, and he couldn't figure out why. Some scientists were like, maybe we have extra planets in our solar system, and let's try to find them. We couldn't find the extra planets, okay? But then 250 years later, this guy, Albert Einstein, he said, wait a minute, I think what you're missing is that space isn't just this flat thing that doesn't interact. Space is actually like a fabric. It's like this three-dimensional thing that can actually curve. It can stretch and it can compress, right? It looks something 
like this amazing shirt that a friend loaned me. I was going to wear it, but I'm not going to have my back to you all night, so that's kind of lame, right? So you have this amazing space that can curve around, okay? Now, what Einstein said is, hey, geometry of space actually curves, okay, based on how much mass you have. So it's not that these two objects are just pulling on each other instantaneously, it's that space itself is moving around the object. So then other objects interact with the space, and so it causes them to move. And he also said, hey, you know what? Time is also affected, and nothing happens instantaneously. There's no such thing as instantaneous. This doesn't exist. There's a maximum speed limit in the universe. Does anybody know what that maximum speed limit is? Speed of light, right? Three million, no, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. <laughs> uh, okay, now that means that what he's saying is that time and space are actually intermingled. So if you have a very heavy object, time can actually slow down. Okay, so he did this in 1916, he published a paper, and he also said that, you know what, if gravity is actually bending space, that's a disturbance in space. It can cause an oscillation, like a gravity wave, okay? So it's kind of hard to see that here because I'm talking about this three-dimensional space curving and we're in a two-dimensional screen. So I have this neat little gif that I found that kind of illustrates it a little better, okay? So you have this three-dimensional cube and you have a mass that's moving around inside and as it moves, you see space bending to accommodate that mass. Okay, now one thing you might notice is that as it's moving, the space is bending and then it's bending back and then it's bending and then it's bending back, right? So it's stretching and compressing. So when it turns green, that's like strong force, okay? So it's compressing around the mass and then it stretches back to its original shape. Now, if you think about the space outside of this cube, there's more of it, and so the space outside of that then has to accommodate, so that's how the wave happens, right? So if you think about a wave coming past you, a gravity wave, what it's gonna do, it's kind of fancy, if I take my hula hoop and I say this is like a section of space, okay? What a gravity wave is gonna do when it comes past me is the gravity wave is going to squeeze in one dimension and stretch in the other, and then it's going to stretch in that dimension and squeeze in the other. So you just have this really cool bounciness, right? And so this is one single slice of space, but we have three dimensions of it, okay? So how can I actually visualize that? I know it's actually hard to visualize, but I found the most amazing gift that I've ever seen in my whole life, okay? And it's this guy right here. This is lovely, right? This is from ESA, which is European Space Agency. They made this gift to kind of demonstrate what's happening with when a gravity wave passes through space, okay? So what you're seeing is this compression in one direction and a stretching in the other, followed by the reverse. So now what was stretched is now compressed and what was compressed is now stretched, and that is traveling. So you see this waveform but you also see it on the side. You see it in three dimensions. So you see this really weird like wobble, 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 wobble kind of thing, right? Now for me, I think that this looks a lot like Shai Hulud from Dune, but it's not. It's actually just a gravity wave, okay? And the question is, this is super tiny, right? This, we, we don't actually feel some giant force stretching and compressing us. Did you guys feel that today? Because I didn't. Right? And the reason is because the gravitational force is actually super tiny, right? So how do you get more gravity? What do we need for lots of gravity? Lots of mass, right? So what are the giant masses? Where can we find these giant masses? Now, our closest giant mass, of course, is the sun, right? Our star, okay? Now, this is an image showing how the sun warps that space-time, okay? So you see this little bend now in space. So it's pulling it down. So anything that's within that is going to now kind of curve in, okay? Now, we need something heavier than our sun because I don't feel gravitational waves from the sun 
I don't know if you guys do, okay? So what do we have that's heavier than our sun? Well, there are other stars that are heavier than our sun, but we need something that's really dense as well, right? We need a lot of mass in a small area, okay? So say what? A black hole, okay. Well, before we even get to a black hole, there's another thing, what? Neutron stars, okay? So neutron stars happen when you have a really large star and it has a lot of mass and it can't handle it and it explodes in this huge supernova explosion and then part of it collapses into this tiny little thing that's about 20 kilometers in diameter and it's left with like 1.4 times our sun's mass in this tiny area that's twice the size of San Francisco. It's pretty cool. That's really heavy, okay? So that's pretty good. That causes a deeper bend in space time but then what if we need something even heavier than that, right? Somebody said it. Black holes, right? We can get stars that are so heavy that they can't collapse into a tiny neutron star. They have to just collapse all the way, right? Their core is so heavy because it's full of lead because lead is the maximum uh, chemical that it can make through fusion. And so its core gets so full of lead and it gets super, super heavy and it just collapses. And it becomes this really huge <laughs> deep bend in space, okay? So that's great. Now we know that we have these giant masses, right? And so what do we need to get an actual wave going from these giant masses? Say what? Mushroom? Motion. You know, I'm hard of hearing, <laughs> yeah, right? We need motion. So we need some acceleration going on. So how can we get these things to accelerate? We're gonna talk about black holes because they're the easiest, because they're the heaviest. So they're gonna give us the most motion, okay? So turns out that a lot of these things, both neutron stars and black holes, in exist in what are called binary systems. So this, for example, is a simulation showing two black holes rotating around each other and they are warping space around them. Now I want you to pay attention to space here. You see it's stretching and then compressing and then stretching and then compressing. And as they get closer, that stretching and compressing is happening more quickly and it's a stronger effect. And then they crash into each other and wiggle, wiggle, it's all over. It's really fast and then it's done, right? Now, that might be hard for you to picture in like a wave kind of format, right? So now, what about a wave, okay? If we look at it in terms of what we think of as waves, this is another simulation. It's the same exact event. You have two black holes, they're rotating around each other, and they are disturbing space-time around them. And that wave is traveling outward. Now, as they get closer to each other, the wave is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And then eventually it crashes into each other and the wave stops and it just goes outward. How fast is it going? It's the speed of light because there's no mass involved. It travels at the fastest speed in the universe, according to Einstein, of course. Is he right? Well, turns out that he figured out Mercury's orbit with his theory of gravity, his general relativity. So he might be right but how can we tell for sure, right? We need to actually measure these things. So as this goes out in space, what is it doing, right? It's warping space time. What does that look like on Earth? So as this wave travels from the two black holes crashing into each other, it's gonna hit Earth and it's gonna stretch Earth in one dimension and compress it in the other and then it's gonna go the other way. So we have this like wiggle, 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 right? So Earth is gonna wiggle, and then when it hits us really hard, it's gonna wiggle really hard. This is highly exaggerated, <laughs> okay? <laughs> we are not actually gonna feel the wiggle at all. So what you saw there was like uh, hundreds of miles of wiggle. Uh, what we actually would feel is on the order of one one thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> this is 1 times 10 to the minus 19 meters, okay? So it's super, super tiny, tiny, tiny change. How can we possibly measure a change that small? Lasers! That's why I'm a laser chick, right? We're gonna talk about lasers. 
Okay, so we use this thing called an interferometer. If you guys want to play with one, we have one in the back. If you just go straight back to the other wall, it's right on the wall. Um, so we have a laser, and you send the laser down some path. You're going to pop in what we call a beam splitter that takes half of the light and allows it to be transmitted. Half of the light gets reflected 90 degrees. So you have this beautiful uh, orthogonal system right, of light. Then you're going to pop a mirror in, two mirrors in fact. One mirror in one arm that's transmitted and then one mirror in the other arm that was reflected. That sends the light right back down to where it started. If you align this guy perfectly so that each of these arms travels the exact same length, you can actually cancel out light. You can make a single light wave cancel itself out, which is amazing, right? So if you have your two waves, one of them is, has a peak when the other one has a crest, you will have no sing signal because it cancels itself out, right? If you have the two waves uh, adding up together, then you get a signal. So if you align this guy so that one arm is just half a wavelength away from the other, you will get no signal from it, and it's beautiful to see no light coming from light. Let me tell you, it's fantastic, okay? Now, in order to do this, though, uh, what's going to happen is now the gravity wave is going to come and it's going to wiggle my interferometer, right? So if I have a mirror here at the top and then I have a mirror here on the side, I'll have to hold it here, right? Mirror here, mirror here. As I shake this guy, right, this mirror is going to go up, this mirror is going to come in, and then vice versa, right? And this is going to keep happening. As it does that, I'm going to start seeing light where there was no light before, right? And so I'm going to be able to measure how much light I see, and from that I get to know how big a gravitational wave is, right? Totally easy, not hard at all, right? The catch is, because this light, uh, because we're looking for such a tiny difference, we need a huge length of this arm, like huge. We need each of these arms to be about four kilometers, which is two and a half miles. So we need a laser that goes two and a half miles out in two different directions uh, and then comes back, right? Can we do it? Yes, is the answer. We need giant freaking lasers, okay? And we have them. When I say giant, I mean giant. So these are our two systems. It's the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO for short, okay? Now, one of them is in Louisiana, in Livingston, in a forest, because we don't want a lot of vibrational noise from the city. And then the other is in Hanford, Washington, uh, which is in a desert, right? Because again, we don't want a lot of vibrational noise from the city. So they're separated out by about 3,000 miles, okay? So they're 3,000 miles away from each other because we really want to have two signals to confirm each other, right? If you just have one and you see a wiggle, it could be some dude chopping down a tree in the forest or like a concert or something, right? But we want to know, okay, is there something that happens there? There's a wiggle over here in Louisiana and then there's a wiggle in Washington it must be real, right? Now, these things have to be extremely sensitive. So we need mirrors that are absolutely decoupled from the Earth. So this is inside of the LIGO system. This is an actual photograph of their mirror. Now, this is a quadruple pendulum. So around this corner, you'll see a bunch of pendulums, and you'll kind of get a feeling for how a pendulum can decouple motion from the start to the finish, okay? So here, it's connected to the building, to the ground, and then it's decoupled once, and then twice, and then three times, and then here, it has these actual really thin silica fibers. So the mirror is literally just hanging on like dental floss, floating in free space, so that it cannot vibrate because of the Earth's motion. And the mirror itself, first of all, it's pretty big. Okay, it's about 20 inches in diameter, and it's the most sensitive, the flattest mirrors that we have on the planet right now. On top of that, you see this dude's wearing a really cool bunny suit, right? That's because he's in a vacuum, right? I mean, obviously the vacuum's not on right now or he wouldn't be alive, uh, but this is a vacuum tube that all of this has to be in because we want light to travel at the speed of light and not slower than that right? And we don't want any dirt or anything inside the system that could affect our measurements because we're talking about 
1 times 10 to the minus 19 meters, right? Okay. So that being said, they built this thing. They started out in 1998, okay? They turned it on in the early 2000s, and they saw nothing, right? So they had to upgrade it. They said, you know what, we need better pendulums. They didn't have this quadruple pendulum set up in the beginning, and they were like, you know, we need to do this a little better. We need to make our mirrors a little flatter, uh, and we need a better vacuum. So this vacuum system is actually the second best vacuum system in the world after the Large Hadron Collider. It's the strongest vacuum, okay? Second strongest vacuum. So then they made a bunch of adjustments, and they turned it back on in 2015. They turned it on in August, and then... Guess what happened? They saw a signal, like right away. Like right away. It's pretty cool. This never happens. I don't know how many of you guys have built something or worked on your car or fixed a vacuum cleaner or anything, but like it never works right away. If you have to do something, you got to take three times as long as you really need, right? You have to factor in all this additional time. Nah, it worked, right? So this gravitational wave detection has a name. It's called GW150914. That's just the date. They're real clever, these scientists, right? So gravitational wave, 2015, September 14th. That is the date, OK? Here's the cool part. I mean, it's all pretty cool, but this is really cool. OK, so this is the data from Washington and Hanford. And then this is the data from Livingston. Now you see two things. You see like a really squiggly line, and then you see a smoother line. The squiggly line is the raw data. The smooth line is the prediction based on some calculations that they did to try to figure out what exactly was happening, okay? What exactly was happening was two black holes crashed into each other, okay? That's actually what we're seeing. So on my shirt, for example, is the signal. Okay, so you have these two black holes. When you have this long frequency, they're rotating around each other. They get closer, so the wave gets tighter, and then they actually crash, and you see the bloop, and then it rings down, and you see nothing. The cool thing is, these two signals, first it came in uh, Livingston, Louisiana, and then seven milliseconds later, it showed up in Washington, right? And so they were like, wait, why do we have this seven millisecond delay? It's the speed of light, right? That's how long it took for light to travel from Louisiana up to Washington, right? So if we shift this data by seven milliseconds, we can overlap them and you see that they're almost perfect. This is beautiful. This is confirmation that Einstein was absolutely right, okay? Space-time does curve based on mass, and we do get gravitational waves, and they travel at the speed of light. Gravity does not happen instantaneously, okay? Even cooler, scientists were like, you know what? This is a frequency. I mean, we can't hear it because it's really low. It's just a, a <laughs> it's our mirror jiggling a tiny amount, and we can't hear that. But we can shift it up into frequencies that we can hear. So let's see if we can hear it. It's kind of loud in the museum, but... Let's see. So first you're going to hear the actual sound, and then you'll hear it shifted up into a register that we should be able to detect. Uh-oh. There we go. So nothing. Right? You hear that? So there's nothing. Right? Okay, that is a chirp, it's called, right? It went from a low frequency up to a high frequency really, really fast. That's what a gravitational wave sounds like. That's what the jiggle of the Earth sounds like, okay? So this is all super cool. Now, every talk that I give, I like to highlight a scientist from an underrepresented group. Uh, in particular, today, I'm going to highlight Corey Gray. Corey Gray is a physicist. He lives in Washington. He's actually the lead operator at LIGO in Washington. He was the lead operator on the day that they got this gravitational wave. Um, he started with them in 1998. He helped build the facility. He's been there since then, and he's still there. He's going strong. He's actually a Blackfoot Indian, and his, he's amazing because he was really excited about this, and he wanted to share this with his people and his reservation, so he had his mother translate all of the LIGO press releases into Siksika language, which is her native language. Now, this was really hard because Siksika is actually a spoken language, 
it's not really written. So she actually wrote a dictionary to transcribe the language so that she can actually share it with everyone else. Um, so I think that's fantastic, and that's Corey Gray. And he has this super cool tattoo on his arm. Okay? Uh, you might recognize that. That's actually the signal that we got. That's the first gravitational wave that we ever found. And fun fact about this tattoo, he got this tattoo on Pi Day, which is March 14th, in 2016, which is a 100-year anniversary of when Einstein made his prediction in the first place. And also, Pi Day is Einstein's birthday, for those of you guys who didn't know. So this tattoo is actually very special to him. And he's a super cool guy. Now, uh, this led to more things than just people getting tattoos, right? This was a huge discovery in physics. And it made the whole world pay attention. And so now it's an even bigger collaboration. So we have uh, a smaller... Uh, interferometer in Germany. It's called GEO 600. The 600 is because it's only 600 meters long. They have a tiny interferometer in Germany. So it can't actually see very far back in time, right? I forgot to mention, those two black holes that were uh, rotating around each other and crashed into each other, that happened 1.3 billion years ago. So it happened and that light took 1.3 billion years to get to us. And because of our calculations, and we see how well the calculation fit the real data, that's how we know that that's how long ago it was, okay? It's pretty fantastic. Now, we figure we can go back even farther if we have a bigger interferometer, okay? Or better sensitivity of our current interferometers. So also there's one in Italy. Now this one is only three kilometers long, but it's also very good and it has very high sensitivity. So he joined on. So now, since 2015, when we got our very first signal, these are all calculations, we have confirmed that we have 10 black hole mergers that we have measured. Now, that being said, this thing has only been online for a few months out of those three years, okay? So it was on for three months, or four months, right? So from uh, September through December, we saw three right away, and then we took a year off to upgrade it to make it a little bit better, right? Update our mirrors, update the laser. And then we turned it on and once again, we started seeing them, right? And then the Virgo, which is the Italian uh, interferometer, it joined forces with us and now we saw five. We saw four of them in August alone of 2017. This is pretty fantastic, right? So this is a really big deal and it's such a big deal that it was awarded the Nobel Prize in physics in 2017, which was not a surprise to anyone because this was, it's revolutionized astronomy and the way that we think about physics. And so uh, Rainer Weiss is from MIT. He's, he's the guy who said, hey, let's use a laser. So he gets half the prize because he's dope, right? Then there's Barry Barish and Kip Thorne who were both at Caltech. Um, and so Kip Thorne, you guys might know uh, because he actually is the science advisor for Interstellar. So he's been doing this work for 50 years and he actually contacted Hollywood and said, hey, I wrote this book about science and like you guys should make a movie about it. And they're like, okay, let's cast Matthew McConaughey. And they did and you know, it was a cool film. Um, and so the cool thing is that right before this happened, like a month before this was announced, something even cooler happened. Now, the room's gonna shake a little bit, so I want you guys to be prepared, okay? So a month before this happened, right, these are the signals that we've seen before. They take about a second, that little chirp that we heard, right? All of those take about one second or less. They're like half a second. And then on August 17th in 2017, right before the Nobel Prize was awarded, there was this, and it keeps going. And they're j what's happening, right? And mind you, we have LIGO in, ooh, you feel that? We have LIGO in Hanford, Washington. We have the LIGO in Louisiana. And we have the Virgo in Italy. So all three of these lasers are seeing the same exact signal. And of course, this is already converted, up-converted so that we can hear what it actually sounds like. And it's still going by the way. <laughs> it's my favorite thing ever, okay? So 
what is that, right? This is 60 times longer than anything that we've ever heard before, right? And the reason is because it must be coming from something that has less mass than those black holes that we were seeing before. So it's moving slower. So what has less mass than black holes? Neutron stars, you guys. We saw a neutron star merger. OK, so I'm sorry, I get very excited about this. So here is a simulation showing the neutron star merger. OK, now you see the two stars. They're orbiting around each other. They're already warping space time. And then they get closer, and they spin faster and faster and faster. And then they crash, and they release those gravity waves. But they're also releasing light, and they're releasing mass into space. They're just exploding all of this mass and light into space. That's craziness, OK? Now, this is intense because now we have three different LIGOs, which means we can tell exactly where it came from, right? We can say, oh, I know how long it took to get from here to there to there. So I'm going to call up everybody who has a telescope on the planet, and I'm going to say, point your telescope over there. And they did. And so over 100 telescopes were observing this neutron star collision at the same time. So for two weeks, we measured this neutron star merger. We got it in gravitational waves. We got it in radio waves. We got it in microwaves. We got it in infrared. We got it in visible light. We got it in ultraviolet light. We got it in x-rays. And we got it in gamma rays, which means we know everything there is to know about the neutron star merger, except for, of course, what happened after they crashed into each other. We actually don't know. They might have formed a denser neutron star. They might have formed a black hole. We don't know yet. OK? So all of these telescopes, not only on Earth, but also in space, right? they all pointed there and found out what was going on. And what they found was that this happened 1.3, or no, sorry, 130 million years ago. So it was closer to us than the original black hole merger that we saw the first time. OK? Uh, but they also found that we now know where heavy metals come from. Remember I told you that the core of a black hole, right, when a black hole's forming, the center of that is, it's got lead in it, and then it can't go any further. It needs more energy to make heavier elements, but it can't get that energy through just fusion. But apparently, when two neutron stars can crash into each other, that gives us the energy we need. Now we know where gold and silver and platinum comes from. All of these heavy metals actually come from neutron star mergers, and we did not know that before. We had an idea, like we said, maybe, or I don't know. There's no way we can measure it. Einstein said we can't measure gravitational waves, but we did, OK? So this was a huge deal. This happened in 2017, and we're still analyzing data from that event. And since then, they've actually taken the system offline, so they're making some improvements. So right now, where we are is we're making improvements to our current LIGO systems. They're actually coming online April 1st, which is next week. So be ready. Like, pay attention to the news, because you're going to hear some cool stuff soon. OK, we're, the, the idea is we were seeing a merger at least, uh, we were seeing at least one, one a month. And the idea is with these new advancements, we're going to try to see at least one a week. OK? Then we have another system. So we've got the GEO 600. We've got the Virgo in Italy. We have another system being built right now in Japan. This one is super dope because it's underground. OK? This one's also three kilometers long. It's underground, so there's less vibrations. And they are going to cool their mirrors with cryogenics so that they have even more sensitivity. OK? So this is really going to help us. And it's on the other side of the world. Like, it's way farther, right? Then we also have another LIGO system coming up in India. So we are now in collaboration with India. We are building another LIGO that is going to be identical to ours, but it's going to be in India. And then the coolest part, this is the best thing you guys are ever going to hear in your whole life, we have space lasers, OK? This is Lisa. OK, she's beautiful. She is the laser interferometer space antenna. Now, <laughs> I talked about how you need a really long distance to measure a really small change. So we said, hey, let's throw some lasers in space. So this guy 
is one satellite, this is another, this is another, and this laser is going to go between these two satellites and bounce back. The distance between the arms is going to be a million kilometers or a gigameter, right? That's 623,000 miles long. So it's going to be utterly ridiculous, and we are going to see gravitational waves on a daily basis, maybe even more than one a day. So it's a whole new field of astronomy that we've opened up with gravitational waves. So that being said, pay attention to the news because starting next week, you're going to start hearing more about gravity. And thank the stars because all the metal that you have actually came from them billions of years ago. So thank you very much for your attention.